The New York Jets open their preseason with a 21-16 loss to the Cleveland Browns, while Zach Wilson looks good in a very, very limited role. And Mekhi Becton does the same before leaving early and worrying some fans. That and a lot more from last night's game here to discuss. I'm Glenn Naughton with JetNation.com. Be sure to log into JetNation.com where you can register and become a part of what is the most active Jets message board on the web. So Zach Wilson, for me personally, I was encouraged with what I saw last night. There are some fans who are, you know, writing it off for whatever reason. You know, when when fans decide they don't like a player, they're going to find a reason to discount anything they do. Um, Zach Wilson, yes, a lot has a lot of detractors based on how he played the last couple of years, based on how he responded to how he played the last couple of years. That was probably the biggest issue. But lining up under center for the first time after getting his offseason and training camp tutelage from Aaron Rodgers. For me personally, I said this before the game. I tweeted it out asking Jets fans, what's the number one thing you're looking for from Zach Wilson tonight? For me, it was poise. I wanted to see a poised, settled Zach Wilson. No panicking, no happy feet, no bailing on clean pockets, and we saw that. Unfortunately, for some odd reason, Zach Wilson only threw five passes. That, to me, is a glaring mistake by this coaching staff. This is a guy who is being rebuilt from the ground up, and we have to treat him like a rookie all over again because it's a new offense, and he's new footwork, and everything is brand new. And Chris Streveler threw more passes than Zach Wilson did last night. So he, Chris Streveler is getting more ramped up than Zach Wilson. I don't get it. He should have played minimum the first half. Honestly, I would have liked to have seen him play the first three quarters. Instead, plays a few series, throws five passes, and calls it a night. But let's talk about the five passes. Some good stuff. As I said, limited basis, so it's hard to take it with more than a grain of salt. However, it is progress, which is, at this point for me, that's all I'm wanting from Zach Wilson. I know he's not going to turn this thing around overnight. I just know that if he is ever going to turn this thing around, which remains to be seen, it's going to be little by little. And last night was a little. What did Zach Wilson do? He Well, he hit on a deep ball, which, funny enough, was, was apparently called by Aaron Rodgers from the sideline, according to Zach Wilson, um, after the game. But a 57-yard flick of the wrist bomb to Malik Taylor that traveled 50.8 yards in the air. And it really was effortless. From deep inside their own territory, I believe they were inside their own five. And Wilson short drop back and flicked his wrist. 50-yard completion. Taylor picked up another eight after the catch. So a good job there. Wilson also threw only one screen. You know, that's, that, that, that's part of the poise I was hoping to see was swings and screens because I've used the term swings and screens about 50 million times since last season. It's an area where Wilson has struggled. I hope they would come out and throw a bunch of that stuff because really, having said poise was the number one thing I wanted to see, that kind of ties into that because it's the happy feet, the unsettledness, the, the rushing of the throw, the sloppy mechanics that has led to the poor throws on what should be the easy throws. So I was hoping to see a lot of that. Instead, we saw one screen. It was to Izzy Abanacanda. It went fine, but really, let's, it's one play. Um, I, again, I was hoping to see four or five screen passes. But Wilson completed the screen, hit on the deep ball, looked decisive. And when he did face pressure, there you know he didn't face a ton of it because, again, only a few snaps. But when he did face pressure, he hung in there a bit. This was pointed out on the broadcast. If you watch the game, Chris Collinsworth pointed out, you know, he was probably on about his third progression before he bailed and tried to run for a first down. Had an easy first down if he hadn't slipped. But he did slip, drive ended prematurely. That was that. So a very small sample size, as I said, for Zach Wilson, but some very, very encouraging signs. Mekhi Becton starting at left tackle. For me personally, that's the guy I was watching during the snap. I think most fans... Who, uh, who weren't following the ball were probably watching Makai Becton. And he was flawless. He was the first play of the game. They ran right behind him. Becton moved his man out of the way. Five, six-yard gain for Izzy Abanacanda. In pass pro, he was fine. Again, Becton only played seven snaps. And here's the concerning part. Well, again, the good news is he looked fine. Becton moved guys, had little difficulty moving guys on run plays, gave up a little bit of ground on one, maybe two rush plays, but dropped his anchor and didn't allow any pressure. So Becton, a perfect night for him, but seven reps after Robert Sala said they expected him to play 25. That's concerning. Again, you're talking about rebuilding a guy, getting him back from zero to game ready. 
and you say he's going to play 25 snaps and he plays seven. And Robert Sala was pretty elusive about it after the game. He was really doing everything he could to not say anything alarming. He didn't want to use the word hurt. He didn't want to use the word injured. He was very careful with his words, just saying uh, Makai had some conversations. Um, he was in the game, and then he had some conversations with the training staff. And, uh, you know, he's okay. We're not worried. But uh, his, his knee was, was, you know, he was feeling it a little bit. And he had some communication with the training staff. So he was feeling it a little bit, and he had communication was the way Robert Sala described it. What it boiled down to, Becton's knee was bothering him. And he basically let the coaches know. They took him out of the game. He then went back on the field for one rep on field goal, which, and, you know, folks said this to me on Twitter afterwards, oh, it's just a special teams rep. Listen, we're talking about a multi-million dollar asset who just publicly accused you of pushing him too hard and leading to an injury. There is no way you should be putting him back into a game after pulling him because he's injured. I don't care what rep it is. I don't care what he's doing. That guy should not be doing anything other than standing on the sideline with his helmet in his hands. And that's basically, other than the one rep for field goal, that's what Beckton ended up doing. So here you have a guy, showed his potential again, his first game in almost 700 days. I believe it was Rich Samini said, you know, it was, it's been 691 days between, you know, from the time Beckton hurt his knee against the Panthers in the opener a couple of years ago. So Beckton goes out there, looks really good. Again, was able to was able to execute as a run blocker as a pass blocker but he came out after seven snaps after the game probably even more concerning were Becton's comments where he basically said he came out because the turf was bad for his knee I mean listen you're going to play on different turfs every Sunday um, or almost every Sunday I don't know if there are specific turfs specific surfaces that are going to lead Mekhi Becton to not being able to finish a game. Um, Becton said this is his new normal, that dealing with this pain is going to be the new normal. Well, that, and listen, this is coming from, I've done several videos just in the last couple of weeks talking about how if Mekhi Becton is healthy, he's the best tackle on this roster and he needs to be starting. And it's we uh, that upsets a lot of people. Um, people get mad when I say a healthy Mackay Becton should start. And the funny thing is, I get a lot of, but he's never healthy. He's never healthy. He's not okay. But but the, the comment was, if he is, like that's that's where I'm coming from. If Mackay Becton is healthy, he's the best tackle on the roster. If you are the best anything on the roster, you should be starting. Mackay Becton cast nothing but doubt on that last night by saying what he's saying. I had to come out of the game because of the turf, and this is going to be the new normal. That doesn't sound like a starting player to me. And it's not, again, if it's if it's due to, well, it is due to this injury that was really, you know, as we've discussed a million times, the at the hands of a fluke accident uh, two years ago against the Panthers. But that doesn't sound like starting player talk to me. You know, I left the game early because I didn't like the surface, and this is going to be the new norm for me. So maybe Makai Becton is playing himself into a swing tackle, you know, a few reps a game kind of guy. Uh, you know, jumbo package, extra tackle, something like that. Hopefully, it was just a poor choice of words, and he's going to be getting ramped up. But you can't – listen, I'm I'm the biggest supporter of Makai Becton out there, or as big a supporter as anybody out there for Becton. As I've said from day one, I've, I've said I, I firmly believe once he's healthy, he will be a starter. Maybe he's not going to be healthy. And he said it last night. So that changes things. That makes the Jets' tackle situation a lot more dire. Um, it did mean that Carter Warren got in the game earlier. And I thought he looked all right for a rookie who, you know, had never played an NFL snap, got into a game earlier than he was expected. I thought he looked solid. I'm going to, you know, rewatch the game today. It's so tough without all 22, which they don't make available for preseason games. I wish they would. But Carter Warren got a lot of run. Joe Tipman played beginning to end. And, again, this is where I wish there was an All-22 available. From what you can tell of the sideline angle, which is not very good, for, it, for especially for evaluating interior offensive linemen, he's literally got multiple bodies around him on every play, so you can't really isolate him and look at how he's doing. But he did play the full game. 
um, which is the good news. The bad news is we didn't really see any push up the middle. Um, the, you know, the Jets only averaged a couple yards a carry, and the the few the closest things they had to any big runs came on the outside. Um, one from Izzy Abanacanda, a touchdown run. And listen, the speed was evident with him. There's a reason why the Jets drafted him when they did. Um, you know, I said it a million times while he was at Pitt. He's a home run hitter. He's a guy who, you know, by adding him, you're giving yourself another option if and when Brees Hall can't go. You're not leaving yourself in a position where you no longer have that guy who's a threat to go the distance if you give him a crease. So Izzy Abanacanda showed, you know, was, that he was able to do a little bit of what we saw him do in college. The unfortunate part, and this happens a lot in the preseason, although, funny enough, it never seems to happen against the Jets. Um, but the Jets' O-lines, listen, by the time they get to that third, fourth group, there's never any room for anyone to do anything. So you can look at Travis Dye, who averaged one or two yards a carry, and say, well, that guy was terrible. He just, there was no room for him to do anything. Um, that backup offensive line was just getting abused regularly. No, you know, zero room to run. Pass pro wasn't bad, but it didn't matter because Chris Drevler was in the game. And listen, Chris Drevler, cool, funny, likable, all that stuff, not an NFL quarterback. Let's Can we please move on from this Drevler product, project? Unless you want to say, let's, move, let's make him a special teamer with a package of plays, which really, I'm ready to move on from that idea, if I'm being honest. But uh, having Chris Trevler throw more passes than Zach Wilson in a preseason game uh, makes no sense to me. Really, he, in all reality, he shouldn't be on the roster. Some of those throws he made, he actually had decent protection with the, with the, uh, the third and fourth unit on the O-line. Um, and it didn't matter. It didn't matter. He just missing guys left and right. I think he completed one pass, uh, one for seven. Uh, but he's still here. Boyle um, looked solid, you know, again, solid, unspectacular did the easy stuff, made it look easy, but listen, when you're comparing him to Strebler, he looked phenomenal. Uh, you're comparing him to an average NFL starter, he wasn't that great either. That's why myself and many others have been making the point that the Jets should be pursuing another quarterback, because really they don't have a viable number two, unless Zach Wilson, and I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful, unless Zach keeps taking these little baby steps, because last night was big, again, and you know, a lot of people will say doesn't matter about Zach, it's just the preseason. Listen, do you honestly believe that last year's version of Zach Wilson, especially the late season version of Zach Wilson, do you think he could have pulled off what he did last night, preseason, backups or not? He was a complete wreck last year. He needed to spend this offseason fixing himself and look like he did. Again, calm, measured um, preseason. No one's saying, you know, he's going to take over for Aaron Rodgers next year. None of that. Just the kid showed progress. So we saw progress from Wilson. We saw some good things from the rookies. Um, Chaz Surratt, a linebacker I've talked about a fair bit. I said a couple weeks ago I thought he was the least talked about player who could make the roster. And I've been asking, you know, I for, for those of you uh, follow me on Twitter, I shot a message at Antoine Staley the other day saying, like, are any of the – the young linebackers making any plays because we're not hearing it. We're not hearing anything in camp about any of these young linebackers doing much of anything. Other than, you know, Zaire Barnes had an interception a couple weeks ago. That was about it. Um, but Surratt looked really smooth in a backpedal. Uh, zone coverage, picked off a pass, had eight tackles, four solo, four assists. Did leave the game early with a hamstring. Uh, what Salah said, you know, they said that a couple guys with minor hamstrings. I'm assuming that that puts Surratt in that minor category. But he's a guy I've talked about as a sort of dark horse to make the roster. I didn't project him there because I think I, I have a feeling they're going to carry four. But I think if they carry a fifth, which I would love to see them do, I think Surratt makes it. But it was good to see him make a play, given an opportunity. Uh, Trey Dean had the quietest 15 tackle day you'll ever see. Eight solo, seven assisted. Um, not not really any huge plays, but he was around the ball and he, you know, didn't see anything. Not I don't recall any missed tackles, so he did a nice job. Marquise Waters was on the field an awful lot, had an early killer penalty that uh, kept the drive alive for Cleveland. But he they they clearly, you know, it, it's it's a funny thing with the preseason when guys get a ton of reps around week three, week four, you're like, all right, well, we're not not so much week three, but the final preseason game. I always feel like, well, these are the guys they're cutting because by now they know who they're keeping. 
and uh, and they're not worried about risking injury on these guys. But early on, I tend to think, well, these are young dudes who they want to, who they like, and they want to see as much of them as possible to see if they think they can make the roster. And Marquise Waters got a lot of reps, as did Trey Dean. Both safeties, Waters, for some versatility, um, as I've talked about, as a player I think could make the roster since Chuck Clark went out. Um, Waters did a lot of what Clark did in college in terms of – well, Waters in college did a lot of what Clark did in the pros in terms of playing all over the field. So we'll see what happens there. The corner play wasn't great. Uh, Brandon Eccles looked a little bit sloppy. Uh, Brees Hall um, didn't look great. Or sorry, uh, Bryce Hall didn't look great, and he's a guy you wonder if he'll be on the roster. That remains to be seen. And Zaire Barnes, who I mentioned earlier, you know, sticking with some negatives, played with his hair on fire and had a couple of had a few reps where he looked pretty solid, but um, also looked to overrun some guys, play a little bit out of control. Maybe it was you know that preseason or not, it's his first NFL game. Maybe he's just fired up and uh, and getting a little bit crazy out there. We'll see if he settles down. But listen, some as you're going to get in any preseason game, some folks did some encouraging things, some folks did some discouraging things. But the guys are just getting their feet wet. They're just getting a feel for it. It's not a starting offensive line. Um, I haven't seen a ton of it, but I've seen a few people comment on concerns and, you know, are we doing this? What are we doing here? What are we doing there? All you're doing is getting guys reps. And, you know, this isn't this isn't your offense. You know, this isn't the offensive. As I said, the only guy, aside from Becton, who is now in question, um, the only guy who played on the O-line who's probably going to start is Max Mitchell. He didn't look that good. Um, the Jets didn't get a whole lot going on the ground when they did. It seemed it was to the left side. Mitchell was on the right. The few times I keyed on him, he, he wasn't really getting any push. He wasn't getting blown up, but he wasn't getting a ton of uh, a ton of push in the run game. I'm going to try to rewatch the game today. Uh, Tipman, as I said, was tough to watch. I would love to see him you know, play at a high level and find a way to steal the starting job at some point, if not right off the bat, which I don't see happening. But it was basically backup linemen with backup receivers. Um, the only – actually, Jason Brownlee, let's talk about him for a second, uh, had a couple of catches, showed a lot of the things that we've talked about from him. Had a couple of – maybe calling them drops is a little bit extreme. He had, you know, two passes on one drive where – uh, a defender got there at about the same time the ball got there and just made a play. And, you you know, he's done such a nice job, or he did such a nice job in college and has done a nice job in camp of winning the contested balls. You would have liked to see him win one or if not both of those. Um, didn't win either one. But when he did get open, you know, quick shifty out of his breaks, was able to create some quick separation and pull in a couple of short passes. So some encouraging stuff there. E.J. Jenkins, the six foot six receiver, converted to tight end. He had a couple of catches, um, one on a poorly thrown ball. I uh, believe it was from Boyle. Uh, where, so we saw a nice effort from him, from Jenkins. Again, he's I mean he's the longest of long shots at this point, given the the number of bodies they have at tight end. Having drafted Koontz and Rucker emerging, you've got Uzama and you've got Conklin. Uh, of course, you've got Kenny Yaboa. Uh, Koontz had a catch. And one thing with him, with Koontz, you know, I thought about this the other day because somebody said to me on Twitter after I posted my projected 53-man roster, and listen, I'll, I do this every year, and it's no different this year. Um, disagree with me all you like on the 53, because every year when I publish it, I read through it, and I, within seconds, can start disagreeing with myself. And I'll think, oh, did it, uh, maybe rethink this guy, maybe rethink that. Chas Surratt, I didn't include him, but I love him, and I've said that he's a guy that I think could steal a roster spot. But when you're sitting down doing a 53 and you're looking at the history of the team, you go, oh, they've generally carried four linebackers, so we're going to go with four. You know C.J. Mosley's not going anywhere. Sherwood's a lock. Barnes is going to make it. And, you know, Quincy Williams, like, that's your four. I, if, it, if there's a fifth, absolutely, Surratt's that guy. But anyway, you know, as, as I'm making this 53-man roster, I, I can go through it very easily afterwards and, and pick guys who I said will make it and go, no, I don't think that guy will make it. And one of them is Zach Koontz. So the Zach Koontz thing is something I was looking at, and I, I do kind of fall into this trap every now and then. Or not even fall into a trap, but I kind of stick with this historical data on draft picks. And I forget when I read this. This was a few years ago. But it's an insane number of draft picks that make rosters. Because GMs don't like cutting guys they just drafted or leaving them exposed on, on the practice squad. So I just always assume every pick is going to make the roster unless they just completely, you know, um, you know, just don't show up. 
if they just show they have no business being in the NFL. And that's rare that you see that. So that's why I have Coons making the roster. But someone said to me on Twitter, what about Kenny Yaboa? And I'm a Yaboa guy. You know, he's he's one of those players that I watched a bit of before the draft, and I, you know, shot him out as a potential guy that the Jets could try to pick late in the draft. Um, and he looked solid last night. And right now, he's definitely a better player than Zach Coons. Zach Coons is a developmental guy. So maybe Yaboa makes it, but I just feel like Joe Douglas and all GMs are really, really hesitant to leave, you know, that year's draft picks either exposed on the practice squad or just release them outright, which is what would have to happen for Kenny Yaboa to make the roster. So it's not that I don't think Yaboa is good enough to make the roster. I just, I always expect the GM to err on the side of protecting their most recent picks. So we'll see what happens there. As I said, Kuntz had a catch. Yaboa had one. May have had two, I forget. Um, but they have a lot of bodies at tight end. And a few of them are, are locks to make the roster. And then you have one or two who are going to battle for a spot, maybe even a third if Jenkins keeps playing well. Jenkins, unlikely. He's, you know, he's making that transition from receiver. He's learning the position. So, you know, he's he's another guy that you will we'll kind of watch develop, hopefully, throughout the course of camp. I think he is a practice squad um, possibility, Jenkins, and we'll, we'll see how he does. But lots of good, some not so good, and and a little bit of worrying. So we'll get more updates today from the team on Makai Becton's status and hope like hell we don't get some, oh, it's a little worse than we thought and he's going to be missing X amount of time because um, I think that would pretty much be all she wrote for Becton if this were to be an, an issue that uh, that causes him to miss any time. So that does it for this one. Jets drop it 21-16. Don't care about the score. Saw a lot of the things we wanted to see. Didn't see some other things that we would have liked to see as you get every preseason. Next up, Carolina Panthers Saturday. Probably won't have a game recap. I will have left the previous day to go on vacation for a couple weeks, so I will be scarce, but I will be around. Be sure to check out Dylan Terman and Chris Schubert on Jet Nation Live on Thursday nights at 6.30. Follow us on Twitter at JetNation.com. Follow myself, JNRadio underscore Glenn, and be sure to check us out on YouTube, our Jet Nation YouTube channel. Have a good one, Jets fans.